Greetings to everyone who has joined in for the webinar today. On behalf of Manage Engine family, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to all our customers, partners, and users who are currently evaluating our products. Thank you very much for joining the session today. Today's webinar is about endpoint management and security solutions. Let me introduce myself. My name is Santosh Narasimha Murthy and I'm part of Unified Endpoint Management and Security line of products. I'm a technical evangelist. I help customers to make right choices when it comes to endpoint management and security. When I say endpoint management and security, Manage Engine offers different portfolios under security and management. We have security line of products which are available individually and also as a suite of products together. So you have Vulnerability Manager Plus, which takes care of both your known and unknown vulnerabilities at an endpoint level, and it helps you mitigate them. Patch Manager Plus is an exclusive patching solution. It's available in suite, it's available in on-prem, and it's also available on cloud as well. You have Browser Security Plus, comprehensive browser security for Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, Edge for now, and we are going to expand it for other browsers too. Data leak prevention by device control for USB-based peripherals. Patch Connect Plus for people who are using SCCM and would like to do third-party patching along with the SCCM. Then you have an add-on to the SCCM plugin called Patch Connect Plus. Then you have Application Control Plus, which takes care of blacklisting and whitelisting of applications in any environment. That's under security. And that's predominantly is what we are going to cover in for today's training as well. And you also have the management uh, side of the NPM, endpoint management and security where desktop central will be the suite which has both management and security functionalities in it. It's a suite of product which also has mobile device manager plus, remote access for remote control and remote management. We also have MSP version of Desktop Central. So if you're a managed service provider looking for supporting your customers, you can use the MSP version. It's also available in remote management RMM Central as well. We'll talk about that. And we also have imaging solutions, OS Deployer, which is a managed engine imaging tool, which you can utilize to deploy the images over the air. So these are the different product lines that we offer under Manage Engine. So we're going to look predominantly into the security side of it from Desktop Central. Welcome to Desktop Central training. Now let's look at the training schedule that we have. The, we are at week two, which is Unified Endpoint Security, which is essentially the second week of our whole training program from the Endpoint Management and Security line of products. The first one being patch management, which is already completed last week in this series. If you would like to view the, view the patch management video, you can go to the link that's shown on the bottom of the screen and click, click on no more on patch management. You will have the video embedded, embedded in the link. You should be able to view those videos, videos as well. And if you'd like to register for the upcoming events, you can use the same link to register for any one of the events that's coming up as well. And you will also be provided with a participation certificate for this training. Please remember this is for series one, two, and three. When you go to the link that's shown on the screen, you should be able to see what includes in series one, two, three, and four. You will get a collated certificate at the end of all the series that post September 29th. So we will collate all the webinar trainings that you have attended and we will send you a single certificate that has all the modules and uh, we'll send it over on the email. Keep in mind, it's only for series one, two, three, and four. Perfect. With that being said, today's webinar and the training will be on the unified endpoint security line of products. I'm going to keep my agenda very simple. We are going to look at how to manage a distributed workforce. How did we manage and how we are going to manage and what are the different challenges that we have. 
though we have different challenges, we are going to look at the top five CAS controls that that uh, that are essential security controls that could reduce your attack surface, and how Manage Engine can help you out in implementing top five security controls by responding to the known vulnerabilities, application control for restricting applications, securing your browsers with the browser security and comprehensive BitLocker management. We also have file vault encryption management as well. And data leak prevention by device control. So how the top five CS control, how Manage Engine can help you out on the in, in achieving that. Achieving the top five critical controls, which means you are reducing your attack surface, and you will see the training for all of this. So when I say desktop central or the unified endpoint management, the first few slides that I'm going to cover is for the new people who have joined in, who are new to the desktop central, who would like to know what's going on. For the rest of them, it's going to be a small recap. But desktop central as a famous reviewer called Forrester, he says desktops and, and unified endpoint management is a product that can have a centralized policy engine for managing and securing employee laptops, mobile devices from a single console. This is the definition that given by Forrester for unified endpoint management. And desktop central fits into the definition of unified endpoint management by providing both traditional and modern management all from one suite. We have both client management, mobility management, modern management for modern operating systems and imaging solutions as well. So you have traditional patching process and you also have control OS update for modern devices. You will have configurations and application management. You'll have profile distribution for restrictions and distributing applications through store. You have remote management, you have geofencing and geo tracking for modern operating systems. So all these together, along with that, you have imaging solution as well. That's the unified endpoint management edition of Desktop Central. So it has everything together. The, these are the list of features that is available with the product at the moment. You have device provisioning for modern operating systems, application management, configuration management, asset intelligence, remote device management, continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation, automatic patch deployment, DLP or data lock pre loss prevention, web protection, and all together com analytics for comprehensive reporting as well. Now, unified endpoint management desktop central is available on cloud, on-prem edition, and you have an MSP version, you have RMM Central, that's another version of Desktop Central for MSPs. It's nothing but it has a combination of network monitoring tools as well as endpoint management tools together, remote management central. RMM Central is available and the general enterprise IT can use Desktop Central for their basic and IT needs as well. So these are the different editions as you see on the bottom, different editions that we provide for the unified endpoint management edition of desktop central. In today's training, we will be focusing on the security side of the unified endpoint management, where we call it as security add-ons that comes inside our unified endpoint management suite, which is application control plus or vulnerability management, device control, bit locker management, and browser security. Now, all these features or modules are available as a suite inside desktop central or you can have them as a standalone edition as well so you can have either of them except for bitlocker management everything else is available as standalone edition so if you'd like to try the product out you can try that as well and desktop central has been here for quite some time and we've been striking awards in different places if you take Gartner's Peer Insight Customer Choice Award. We've been consistently awarded for 2018, 2019, and 2021. What happened to 2020? There was a little difference in, in, in the, uh, uh, the qualification or probably the uh, way they defined unified endpoint management. So it was not part of 2020, but then 
in 2021 we are back into the peer inside choice award as well we've been recognized in magic quadrants as well if you would like to know more information you could go to the link that's shown on the bottom of the screen it should give you more information now with that being said about desktop central what can desktop central manage it can manage the endpoints what do we call as endpoints we can call laptop desktop mobile devices tablets point of sale equipments browsers and servers all these are considered as endpoints for us you might wonder why browser is added to the endpoint list list that's probably because we are using browser like an operating system right now yes it is an operating system at some time but if you if you ask somebody this generation if you ask them what do you do when you open a computer they would say i would go to the browser and start typing what i want and search it so browser being an integral part of our uh, system right now for business applications and web servers so we consider that as endpoints as well what are the different operating systems that we support we support windows mac and linux operating systems if you want to view a glance of the different operating systems there you go on the screen different windows flavors that we support windows a mac os that we support linux operating systems that we support all those are available on screen in case you have a different flavor of operating systems especially for linux if you would like to get support for that please get in touch with us we should be able to see the feasibility and support it for you now let's go into the actual presentation and before i go into that just giving you a word please keep your questions posted on the quick q and a uh, channel i have a panel who could answer your questions and not only that I, I do have a live session at the end of the webinar i'm going to give it five minutes so i will take up all the questions that you're asking on the questions uh, panel i will try to answer most of those questions at the end of the webinar right you don't have to keep it with you you can post it on the q and a section you will get the answers right away and also i would answer it live perfect let's go into the training first things first are you are we equipped for a distributed workforce right when i say distributed workforce it also has a lot of challenges now consider this john being the it manager is he is responsible for managing this entire distributed workforce we used to have or we partially right now have offices connected this way from a centralized locations via mpls links or through vpns tunneling or various other architecture exists and we thought it's the only way to get connected between locations and managing these endpoints at work but that moved to an entirely a different situation everything is moving towards a cloud-based platform and uh, uh, there is no more VPN connectivity, but the applications are available on cloud. Of course, there are a certain percentage of organization who still adopt to the on-prem or connecting via VPN type of architecture. So that's why Desktop Central will be able to cater both. John should be able to manage both the on-prem side of the architecture or if he wants to move to a cloud-based solution and still manage those endpoints, that is also possible for John. That's the whole understanding. Now for John, in this distributed ar architecture or workforce, he had several challenges, had challenges and he still has some challenges as well. When they were at work from office kind of setup, well we did we did have all the applications in-house and uh, the access was just uh, given to the in-house applications there was not needed for an extra authentication and you can even plan the patch updates delayed the patch updates you can do that but you can no longer do it when it's work from home we need to patch the missions on time and not only that their risk of unauthorized access increases because you will never know if somebody else is using those access credentials to get into your corporate environment, business collaboration tools, ID should enable business collaboration tools, and you need extra authentication, something like a multi-factor authentication, and all this should be managed at the user's own internet, bring your own internet, BIOI. So 
i should be able to strike a balance between the productivity and also bringing in security for these endpoints that's become a very big challenge even when they get back to the office we need to have a security compliance and you need to have a quarantine policy when the i mean when the endpoints reaches the corporate network with different challenges with for john and uh, when we look at the cas control it gives us an idea of how to approach it let's see how john's going to implement that let's look at the cas control stop ca5 cas control what they say so the first one it says is the inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices they say please make sure you have an inventory of which are your devices and which could be a rogue device that's the first thing that uh, cas control says and then you you must also have an inventory of what are the applications that is authorized or business applications and what are the other applications that you want to restrict in your environment that's another cas control the third one is you must have secure configurations for hardware and software what it essentially means is that you need to have policies for how you're going to handle the hardware how you're going to have the software install how what are what what for example whether the plugin should be allowed or not what version should be version control and os hardening all those comes into secure configuration for your hardware and software then continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation this is a very important factor continuous assessment of vulnerability and remediation and then controlled use of administrative privilege which means you should never provide unnecessary administrative privileges for the users or even for the applications as well we should make sure we control the administrative privilege so with these five cas principles what we understand is that we can go for an endpoints lockdown just like how we go for a covid lockdown we could put these endpoints in a lockdown situation with all these features in it if we can lock these machines down with these this, uh, these modules then uh, then i think you can reduce the attack surface at the endpoint level we are facilitated in such way let's look at the first endpoint lockdown that is very important which is vulnerability management how do i manage vulnerability known and unknown vulnerabilities right so it's a, it's about responding to the known as well as unknown vulnerabilities at endpoint level when i say the known vulnerabilities it could be due to the applications where the patches are available you're going to patch those applications and unknown vulnerabilities could be due to the endpoint itself with the way they operate or the protocols they use the ports that they use or the settings that's part of the machines could also be unknown vulnerabilities we have automated remediation method and we also have manual remediation methods let's look at how this works with the vulnerability management from manage engine in order to explain this better i have one one scenario that i took for john how can john disable legacy protocols something like tls version 1.1 and over how do he how does he going to you know disable this at an environment he has to identify the machines first about what are the different machines has this vulnerability and he has to remediate it let me take you to the product now this is desktop central product the unified endpoint management suite which has all the all the modules that we spoke about the vulnerability management and patch management software deployment inventory management os imaging solution mobile device manager for ios android windows mac os chromebooks and apple tvs browser security application control bitlocker management device control remote management tools so these are the different facilities whatever i spoke right all under one roof one agent that could do all these features for you so let's get back to the first one so we were trying to address a specific vulnerability the john was to supposed to address a specific vulnerability let's say their security team has told them please disable the legacy protocols which is your tls version 1.1 so that uh, 
you know we we should be able to secure the endpoints so how does this vulnerability work is that it runs a scan at the endpoints just like how it runs a scan for patches and it updates the list of different vulnerabilities that are present at the endpoint level now that's why classified as threats and patches now for patch management for the vulnerabilities that are associated with the application where a patch is available is taken care by the patch management if you would like to know more on the patch management you can look at the video that's or the the one previous session which was completed earlier the video will be available on the registration link you can go there and watch how to do comprehensive patch management we are not going to talk about patch management right now but we have see what are the applicable patches for an endpoint how many are installed how many are missing and you can schedule these patch updates moving to threat side of it at a threat level now i will detect a vulnerability that may have patches and may not have patches as well so when i run a scan say for example i scroll down you can see different vulnerabilities that are available here at my endpoint level let's say i can pick any one of the uh, you know vulnerabilities that's there that's a cvs score is is uh, uh, 10 so here it talks about the vulnerability and it has a patch available so the moment i click on install patch it's going to take me to patch management section and i can deploy the patch to that specific machine or all the affected machines you can see on the second column here number of machines that are affected by a specific vulnerability so you can click on that to see how many machines are vulnerable i mean are affected by that and you can take a decisions based on that this is when a patch is available what if a patch is not available something like that on the top you can see a patch availability status is not available so we will give you information though you have a vulnerability it's about how you want to handle the risk you are having a vulnerability but there is no solution available uh, we tell you the details about vulnerability and what vendor has to say about that vulnerability you can take details from it click the link it takes you to the vendor page this specific vulnerability is related to tomcat and the, the only solution is to move to a different version but generally when the patch is not available we'll give you take you to the third party links that talks about the vulnerability and how you can fix it if no patch is available so either if an automatic remediation like installing a patch is available just a click of a button you can even automate these as well if a patch is not available then you might some do have to do something manual from here the second type of vulnerabilities would be related to the system misconfiguration so we spoke about the software vulnerability the second would be the system misconfigurations so john has to find out if how many machines are enabled with the tls legacy versions so i go here add a filter i'm going to add filter in that i'm going to say category equals i'm going to say tls ssl TL, tls security and legacy protocols so i click on apply filter it's telling me now how many vulnerabilities are associated with the legacy protocols and ssl security tls security here and what are the different machines and what should be done say for example tls version 1.1 is enabled which it could be a vulnerability so we can disable it right out of here click on the deploy configuration it's going to give you a alert message the moment you click on yes it's going to disable the version 1.1 on the machines that you have specified now note it also ha has some alerts or information regard to a specific changes when you do so when you disable tls version 1.1 this could disable browser functionalities as well so you should be aware about what you're doing when it comes to disabling or enabling specific protocols so make sure you know about it and then go ahead and disable it and you could also see there are a lot of other vulnerabilities that is related to ssl and tls some of them are even critical you see the red exclamation mark which is critical you should be able to disable or take action from there if something is not possible uh i, I, I mean if it is not possible from managing inside then we will give more information about it let's take, let's take this insecure rca4 cipher algorithm are not disabled we cannot fix it right from here it has to be fixed from either gpo you can see the uh, steps there as well 
you could uh, go ahead and manually you know remediate that vulnerability right so of these vulnerabilities on system misconfigurations or at application level we can classify zero day vulnerabilities as well we'll give you so that you give uh, which area you have to attack first and get the vulnerabilities to zero that's the ideal condition you can check on the reports zero day vulnerabilities and you can click on the fix it's going to apply the fix it could be a patch or it could be a small configuration changes it will do it on the background now apart from these what are the different other vulnerabilities that we calculate right system misconfiguration itself will have legacy protocols os level hardening and uh, account uh, user account management etc different categories we'll grade them where do we get these uh, uh, categories from? We take it from CAS control and as well as from STHE compliance methods. That's why you see so much of categories there. Coming back to the high risk softwares. Now we consider some of the applications which are end of life or which are using remote desktop sharing or probably peer to when they're using peer to peer protocols, right? We consider them as highly high risk softwares. The example is very simple. If you look at the recent uh, uh, attacks that's been happening, they were all using the remote desktop sharing protocol using the application because those ports were available. So it's always best to go there and audit this. What are the applications that are using the you know remote desktop protocol? What are the applications that involves peer-to-peer -peer community? I mean protocols. You can go ahead and see those and uh, make sure that if you do if you find something that shouldn't be there on the list go ahead and remove it or you can uninstall it and apart, apart from that we also give web server misconfiguration as well if you're running a web server and uh, we also grade the web servers on the different vulnerabilities that are available so if you would like to you know view the resolution just say for example uh the, to restrict access to tomcat configuration uh, directly click on view resolution it's going to tell you how it should be these are manual resolutions for the web server misconfigurations so you you have automatic remediations for some of the vulnerabilities for some you will not have automated uh, remediation you could go for manual remediation as well last one is port audit this is not a vulnerability but if it is an color kind of an alert for you to understand what are the different ports that's being utilized say for example port number 137 which is a udp port it's been accessed by two different machines for a specific service if you th if you think it is suspicious that this port should be blocked and this service should not use these ports you can go ahead and block it on your firewall this is more for an alert purpose. What are the different ports? You can even put a port range, say for example, system ports or registered ports. So I put a system ports and I see on the system ports, what are the different uh, instances that's been used and what are the port type? It should be a TCP or a UDP port. You can get, filter those and take uh, reports and take actions from there. But if you'd like to export these views into reports, you can export into a PDF XLS or CSV as well. this is true of all the views it could be system misconfiguration zero day vulnerability let's say if you'd like to know if a specific uh, uh, cv number is affecting your machines or not you can simply go here to detected cves and i can uh, go ahead and uh, search for a specific cve and see if it is affecting your machines or not right so let's say I go here, search for CVID 17087, and it's going to tell me if that specific CVID is affected, and it says one machine is affected by this. Click on that, it's going to tell you about the CVS score, and you can click on the link, it's a meter link. So you can go to that and, and see the details of a specific vulnerability, right? So that's also available, and in fact, you can export these into views and reports as well. So this is vulnerability management, the first endpoint lockdown, right? That's available. The second endpoint lockdown would be application control. <clears throat> Putting a restriction of what application you need, you can use and what should not be used. You should be able to restrict the non-business applications, right? That's the whole intention. To understand it better, I have posted one scenario for john where he will have to create a whitelist of business applications and only these whitelisted applications should be running at the endpoints apart from that he should not allow anything else to run like from the example it could be just teams and 
edge browser what are you saying <laughs> i think for collaborations you have teams and for every other brow you know applications you can use the edge browser let's let's go to the uh, let's go to the product where you have application control right that's the add on name so on the application control how this basically works it's a very simple all the security add ons works very very simple in a very simple manner so the application control the first thing is you have to define what applications are whitelisted what should be whitelisted and what application application should be blacklisted so how do you know the list of applications in the first place the agent that sits there at every machine runs a scan it takes the details of what are the list of exes that are running who's the vendor what's the product all those information about whatever is running in your environment will be collected and will be available with that i can create a whitelist so i go to application groups i have created this today so i'm just going to modify it you can click simply click on create whitelist from here but i'm going to modify it since i have already done that so click on the list so i gave the name as business applications and i can either select it through vendor or through product names so let's say i need microsoft teams so i search teams so i've selected teams already the one other would be the edge so i should choose microsoft edge of course i need updates too so i select these two and click on update so my allowed business application is updated these two applications are added to my allowed whitelist same way you can do blacklist as well i have created one blacklist here i'm going to modify the same in this say for example i want to blacklist the product called torrent so i go here i have already selected it and uh, i can click on update so this could be based on product name verified executable file hash or folder path or a store apps whatever it is you can select it from the list and you can click on update can i can i block a store app the answer is yes you should be able to do it so i have created the list what's the next thing i have to associate this list to a group of machines first i have to create the group of machines where do i create it so i go to the uh, admin and on the far left you have something called custom groups second option custom groups i click on custom groups i can create different custom groups here this custom group is common for all the security add-ons right you create a policy you map it to a, a custom group that you have created and you create a policy in application control you map it you create a policy in bitlocker you can map it you create a policy in browsers you map it so this group creation is common we have three three types of groups that you can create one is called the static group the other one is called static unique the third one is called the dynamic group i'll give you an example of static group a machine that's part of one static group can always be part of another static group what's the example let's say my machine my name is santosh my machine name is santosh and this machine can be part of chennai that's where the chennai group the cdi i'm here i can create a group called chennai and i'm part of chennai and also i can also be a part of country india i can create another group and it could be part of that as well so the same mission can also be true in group chennai the same mission can also be true in the group india so whenever you target each group this mission will be available so that is static static unique is something if a mission is part of one group i don't want to be i don't want it to be part of another group say for example if you want your technician to manage only server operating systems right you create a static unique groups you add all your server machines to that group so this the machines that you have added to the server group can never be part of another static unique group so that even by accident you cannot create another group so other machines will be managed by a separate technician server operating systems will be managed by a separate technicians that's static unique the third one is about dynamic when i say dynamic it's based on criteria let's say you want to group all the machines in a specific ip range i can do that and or if i want to uh, you know group the computer type laptops together or desktops together or based on a specific software name a criteria you can group those machines as well 
now for people who are already using it keep in mind the dynamic groups the moment you select it it won't give you the correct list here because the validation will always be done at the agent side what i mean is that say for example i create a dynamic group with the specific ip range right so the moment i deploy a patch or an application to that specific dynamic group when the when the configuration goes to those machines by then it will validate which ip they are in they will make sure if it falls under the ip range that is specified here i will deploy the package if it's not i will reject it so the list that is shown here may not be accurate always because the validation will be done at the agent end during the deployment process that's for people who are already using it so good to know information coming back to the application control right so i have created a group and for for the demonstration purpose i have created a group called london right there is a group called london i have added three missions to it so i'm going to use this same london group for different add-ons first one would be the application control i have created the groups as well you can see application groups i have created blacklisted and business applications how do i deploy it i go to deploy policy i click on associate and here i can choose the group that i've created remember the london group so i choose that group and here i'm going to say business applications so the moment i select on business application it's asking me two different options what do you want to do for the rest of the applications would you like to run it on audit mode what's an audit mode it's nothing but you allow the applications which is whitelisted but then you also allow the other applications also to run put them into an audit and send that report to me say you you have 10 applications out of which two are blacklisted but people are running other eight applications two are whitelisted i'm sorry eight other applications are also running in the same machine what do you want to do about it it creates an audit and sends you a report or otherwise if you say you know strict mode it completely locks down the device meaning apart from the whitelisted applications it's going to block everything else on the machine it's not going to allow even a single exe to run on the background which is great because even if a malware tries to somehow reach the your endpoint i'm not going to allow those exes or scripts to run because i am authorized to run only the whitelisted applications that you go all right and you also have one more option that says associate privileged application list uh what do you mean by application privilege application list is that when an application requires elevation right we, we you you do not have you don't have to you know give the privilege uh elevated privileges to the users anymore you don't have to provide it you don't have to provide it to a specific group you don't have to provide administrative rights for them rather what we can do here is you can say which are the application that requires administrative privilege to run if you have that list then you can go ahead and say on the on the bottom left hand left hand side you see privileged management i'm going to use open it on a new link so i can say all the whitelisted applications requires elevated privilege i can go by that or i can say only a specific applications require elevated privilege so what happens is that whenever user runs those applications i will elevate the privilege for that user for that session alone the moment he closes the application i will withdraw that so that that can be decided here as well whether you want to enable it or you say never mind you can click on no so once you create this configuration and click on deploy it will get deployed to the london group this is application control from manage engine right now keep in mind if you have questions please please start posting it on the q and a i will be answering it later on the next brow i mean lockdown will be browser security locking down on the browser so we locked down on the vulnerability management we locked down on the application side now the third lockdown will be on the browser right how do i restrict so for now we support four different browsers chrome edge internet explorer as well as firefox all four browsers are supported now and we are planning to add more as well these are the supported browsers and you can configure uh, you can manage as well as secure these browsers to understand how 
the browser security works. I've taken a couple of CIS benchmarks for these browsers. One of them that talks about, you know, what what policy should be there when it comes to allowing user to enable or disable a specific add-on. What is your policy in that? They say if you allow the user to install add-ons, it is it poses a significant security or privacy to risk to your network. That's what CIS says. So they say you must disable for better security. You must disable the way user handles the add-ons. With browser security from Desktop Central, you will have such facilities. So I click on browsers. In that, first thing is again the same group computer groups. So it is common, whatever you have created on the custom groups will also be here. So say the same London group is already there. So first thing is first, you create a group, which I have already created the same group I'm going to use. Second thing, I can create website groups as well, whether uh, which are my corporate websites, which are my, which are considered as social networking. I could go ahead and create a website, a website group of my own. Then distribution of extensions. You don't have to allow the user to install extensions anymore. Rather, you can go here and add add the extensions to the repository, and then you can distribute it right from here. Let let's let's show how to add a specific extension. So I'm going to choose Chrome extensions. I've deleted one just to give you an example. So I go to the extensions. So I click on Grammarly just for an example. Not that I support Grammarly, but just for an example. So I copy the identifier on the top URL. You see the last part eliminating the question mark. You copy the identifier and you come back to the extension repository. Click on Chrome, paste the report. I mean, identifier, click on add. It's going to add that to the repository. It's already existing trash, so I might have to pick another one. So let's, let's, uh, so it's okay to, okay, Google Translate. I think I've already added that one too, but let's try adding that. Click, select the identifier. There you go. Google Translate, I can click on add. It's going to add to the repository. Now, once you add it, you will be able to click on action and you should be able to distribute to the computers or to a specific group. I click on distribute and there you go. You see the London group again, it's popping up. So I select the London and click on deploy. It's going to deploy to the London group. This is extension distribution. Now the original question for the CIS benchmark is to disable the way user handles add-on. Okay, is that possible? Yes, that's under a policy. So I click on policies. You have different policies that you can make. Add-on management is the policy that we are going to talk about right now, but you have different policies for threat prevention, data leak prevention, customization, locking down the browsers like a kiosk, managing Java, web filters, etc. So I go to add-on management. I'm going to edit the one that is already there, modify the policy. So I can choose to allow the users to either install the extensions or deny the permission, or I can say, Please go ahead and install the extension, but I think I will, you know, blacklist permissions. Think like things like it cannot do video capture, it cannot do screen capture, it cannot take geo locations, it cannot take touch your history, it cannot touch your cookies, you should, should not touch your, uh, you know, background processing. All those functionalities, right? You can go ahead and blacklist those permissions, and then set this up. So it, it's available for Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox, and Chromium as well. You want to call it as extensions or plugins. The way you want to call it, you can and distribute it to your endpoints, right? And with respect to browser security, you also have threat prevention level uh, details, things like creating a policy. Over if a specific site is overriding certificate errors, then I can, do, you know, I can choose to allow or restrict it block the website with excessive ads or third party sites that has inject code in it all those things you can granular level you can restrict and allow same goes for data leak prevention and customization as well customization is very generic things like things like content what do you want to do about the content for uh, content restrictions or for specific urls 
if you want to enable Bluetooth guard, security restrictions, screen captures, uh, allow user to install Chromes or print pages, capture screenshots, all those things you can do a create a policy. Now, more than that, you get comprehensive insights, right? Things like, let's say, browsers. What are the different browsers you are, you have? How many browsers are vulnerable? You can see why it is so vulnerable. Let's say this internet, I will take uh, Chrome, Chromium, for example. I click on view. It's going to say how many machines are non-compliant and what, why is it so? So you can you can either see it could be because of the com different configuration that it has, let's say, let, or it could be due to the out, outdated plugins that they may have or harmful plugins they may have. So I can go inside and see what are the different uh, uh, configurations that are non-compliant and how to resolve it. And not only that, we have given compliance status as well. We have given STAG and CAS compliance. Let's look at CAS compliance. I click on that. It tells me a machine that is not compliant by CAS. I click on that. It tells me what are the different configurations that are not in compliance with CAS benchmarks. I can take actions from it. You click on fix it. It's going to navigate to another page where it tells you how to fix those things. For now, it's not automated, but it gives you detailed steps of how to create policy and deploy it. And not only that, it gives you details, good insights about uh, what are the, I mean, what good details about what were the websites that were visited, how, what are the different downloads they have done. And not only that, you can even go for web filter as well. So if you don't want them to use Facebook during business hours, you can restrict those web activities as well, right? So that's about browser security, browser lockdown. The next lockdown process would be on the USB peripherals. So you locked it down at the patch application level. You locked down a different blacklisting of applications. You locked down at the browser level. And finally, you also locked down at the, I mean, USB peripherals that are connected to it as well. So with desktop central security add-on, we have another add-on called device control which actually takes care of all the USB peripherals that are connected to the device, how you want to handle it. The same process continues. You have a group that's created already. All you have to do is create a policy, map the policy to the group. So I click on create policy, policy click on windows. So you can say pen drives or removable storage devices. What do you want to, how do you want to handle it? If you choose to allow, you get a lot of granular control. Things like, say, for example, it should be only read-only, or it could be, it could allow file file copy, but it should allow only PDF, and it and it should allow only documents, and the file size should be restricted to 100 KB. Something like that, you can do it. And not only that, can I view what is being copied into those drives? Yes, that's also available. It's called as file shadowing. So it will take a copy of the file that's been copied into the USB and store it on a share. Then you can later on audit that what file was copied, right? And you can deploy this configuration. Once you create this policy, you can deploy this configuration, associate policy, choose the policy that you have created. Again, the same London group, as you can see. So the beauty of having the add-ons is that you can create one group of machines or several groups and create different policies at different modules and map all those policies to those individual groups so that you know the the security of those groups will be intact it will reduce the attack surface now you, you don't have to create individual groups all you have to do is define your policy how you're going to move forward in terms of security and you can create separate policies and map them to the machines that you want and you can add exemptions to the machines that you don't want so this is how the device control plus works and if you want to allow temporary access for your guests that's also available so you they can even request uh, temporary access from the agent also so on the agent side uh, if they they can launch a portal called uh, temporary access portal it's launched from the agent tray icon it looks something like this and where they can say allow disk drives for me 
uh, it could be a selected device it, it it could be a selected device that's actually connected to the uh, you know device so i add it i require it for one hour and then send it as a request once the request is done so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight requests. I'm going to refresh the page. The request comes comes up as well. That's the ninth request. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ninth request. So I can go ahead and click on the request that came in, and then click on modify, and then deploy. So it's going to allow one hour usage for that specific removable device alone. That's requesting temporary access. The final lockdown on the endpoints would be comprehensive BitLocker management, right? So we also have BitLocker management. When it comes to encryption, we also have file vault encryption management as well. So coming to BitLocker, it's going to tell you, first of all, what are the machines that has TPM enabled, which is very important if you want encryption to take place post the boot. So TPM chip that are enabled, it tells you the details, what are the different uh, drives that are encrypted and what's the method, those details are available. If you'd like to encrypt or you know enable the policy, we can do that as well. Enable device encryption. If you want to encrypt only the OS drive, I can, or just the free space, I can still do that too. If you would like to rotate the keys and update the group, I mean GPO or, or the domain controller, we can still do those things as well. You can enable and disable it. If you want to re retrieve the recovery key, I can still do that click on the recovery key. I don't need an identifier. I can simply, based on computer names, I can get the recovery keys for specific identifiers, right? So this is BitLocker management. The same is available for file vault encryption as well. That's available under mobile device management of Desktop Central. It's part of Desktop Central's management suite where it handles iOS, Android, Windows, Mac OS, Chromebooks, and Apple TVs. So if you would like to know more about Mobile Device Manager Plus or Mobile Device Management inside Desktop Central, please do visit the same training page. You will have another series, I think it's series two or num series number three. You will have Mobile Device Management training going on. You could register for one of those and get trained on Mobile Device Management as well. So in this, you can go to the management here profiles, create profile, Mac OS, under Mac OS, continue, and you can see file world encryption. You can either create a personal recovery key or institutional recovery key by adding a certificate, personal and institution recovery key as well. However, you want to enable the profile, you can enable file world encryptions too, right? So this is the fifth security add-on. So you have comprehensive vulnerability management, you have application control lockdown, you have browser lockdown, you have device control and comprehensive bit locker management. With that, I come to the end of my sessions. I'm going to take live question and answer. So if you have questions, please keep it coming. I'll try to answer as much as I can. Thank you very much for patiently listening. Let me go back to the Q&A panel. So this, this question always comes up on the webinars. Can you send me a copy of the video? Of course, yes. It would be sent over to you or the email or even you can check back later on, on the same registration link. You will see the past webinars and the one that is going on for today as well. You will get those details. Windows 11 support is not officially announced yet. So somebody asked for Windows 11 support. So it's not supported yet, but it's just a matter of time. We would add that to the list. On the application control dashboard, there is a question about this. I think it's more of Let's go to the dashboard. So the computers that are not part of any group, that's called unregulated. It doesn't have a whitelist. It doesn't have a blacklist, which means they are not probably controlled by anything. So those machines are, are, are part of unregulated ones. How many unassociated applications are there? 
meaning they are not part of white group uh, i mean white list or black list you have to take some actions uh, on them right if you block a policy can an on site technician bypass it if he needs to uh, i'm not sure which uh, policy you're talking about talking about uh, so no the on site technician only let's let's i'll put it in this way only a domain join machine if it's going to come from a gpo from the domain then we will not be able to uh, that that can override what we are doing Right, a GPO can always has an upper hand because that's the domain joint mission. They are the administrators. If they want to change the registries or if they want to change settings on the missions, they can. Uh, otherwise, we will not allow uh, the local users to make changes to the policies that we have. So, for the copy of the videos. Uh, they have asked me since there is a question. I'm just going back to the schedule page. Please bear with me. So, if you look at the bottom of the screen, that says EMS training, EMS slash free training, managingcom slash EMS slash free training. You should be able to get the videos, or you can click on more, no more, on the individual sections. You should be able to get see the videos there. Perfect. I have one other questions. Uh, one other questions that's coming up. So, can I get host names and IP address of those vulnerabilities? Of course, yes. So, I go to threats. I get go to vulnerabilities. Just waiting for the page to load. Software vulnerabilities. You click on that affected missions. It's going to tell you what this mission is, where it's coming from. Let's see if you if you want to add an IP address there. I can do that to the column. There you go, the IP address. So if you want to move that field to the first place, you can. There you go. You have the mission name and the IP addresses that are associated with those machines. How many software vulnerabilities are there? How many server vulnerabilities are there? You can click on the small column chooser to see what other details you want to add there. Right. When was the last time it boot up? What's the location? All those things. I think with that, uh, um, I think we have come to the end of the session. Um, in case you have more questions, keep it coming. I might be available for the next few minutes to take that up on the Q&A panel or otherwise. Thank you very much for patiently listening to my webinar. Uh, I hope the session was uh, helpful for you in order to uh, go forward with the product. Please do rate us on a scale of five, or five being the best when you exit out of a webinar. Next, train, next training schedule is on the software management next week, Wednesday, September 8th. Please do register for that. We have a lot of new things that are coming up for software management as well. If you'd like to go for any personalized demo of the products, please leave us on the chat or you could go to the URL as well. The best thing is to leave us on the chat. We'll get in touch with you, not just demo one-on-one -on -one sessions or help you out, whatever you need. Leave, you on the, leave us on the questions. We will get in touch with you. Thank you so much. And you guys have a wonderful week ahead. Bye-bye. Thank you.